Although I live in the slime and muck of the Dark Age, although I stumble in the thick black fog of materialism, the tradition of meditation is waning and we are drunk with spiritual pride. This is regarded as a very dark age and a time in which the world's wisdom has in some sense faded. This is the time of hell on earth. Sadness is always with us and unceasing depression fills our minds. The Chinese had invaded and there was a time before that when Tibet was really you might say a spiritual paradise. But now it was like a hell. The teachings were going to be lost if it, they couldn't be transferred to the West. And so his whole role in life was to make that transfer. He had an urgency about him. He never gave up on anyone on showing us the full potential of our humanity. The heretics and bandits of hope and fear are transformed into crazy wisdom. crazy wisdom person, which is direct translation from the Tibetan, what's known as the Yeshe Cholwa. Yeshe meaning wisdom, Cholwa is uh, gone wild. So in this case, it's a craziness gone wisdom. We had this conversation way back in 72, I think, in San Francisco. We were comparing our itineraries, and I said, don't you get tired of constantly going around? I'm, I'm getting a little tired of running around. He said, oh, that's because you don't like your poetry. I said, ah, what do you know about my poetry? And he said, well, why don't you do like the great poets of old, like Milarepa? Why don't you just get up on stage and compose on, on the tone? Why do you need a piece of paper? Don't you trust your own mind? The red flag flies above the Potawa. The people of Tibet are drowned in an ocean of blood. A vampire army fills the mountains and plains. But self-existing dignity never wanes. that generation was the last generation that was able to get that full, complete training in Tibet with the great teachers. My father's meditation and everything became expedited, and it became much stronger. Chogyam Trungpa was assigned a teacher who was an extremely highly realized human being, Kampo Gangshar. Wangpo, which means the Lord of all that arises. The monks were often sitting with their malas, sort of telling the beads and reciting the mantra, oh, mani pe meho, mani pe meho, mani pe meho. and Kempo Gangshar would come up and snatch the mala out of the hands of a monk and uh, break it apart and say, oh, mani pe meho, aggression, oh, mani pe meho, attachment of money, pay more home, ignorance. So he was like cutting through the fact that they were just doing something uh, by rote, which had no real meaning. They say you must go to see him. 
I don't dare that. I always run away. I can't bear that to go to see. He says to do something, I terrify. The Chinese presenting their doctrine called a communism and realizing that they can't actually indoctrinate anybody basically fundamentally so they have to use a further greater pressure Temple Gangshar was telling people everything that we've been doing here in terms of Buddhism is over. It's finished. I was forced to leave my country. We are about 300 in a group. It took uh, four months of horseback and six months of walk to be able to get in, in India. Even though Chu Jam Tungba was so young, he knows exactly what we have to do to get away. And somehow I don't know how he managed. He doesn't have a compass. He has very nice binoculars. So we can see long distance. So we have to hide during the daytime and they have to walk in the night through the mountain and through the ice and then start walking in the river. When we reach other side, we know now Chinese are everywhere uh, shooting guns. A hardship is not enough food. And the people are dying, but are uh, uh, starving. Then we actually end up cooking our shoe leathers, chopping it down and cooking it. And I remember him chewing it. It was so horrible. Every of us has weapons. So in uh, our group, uh, no, nobody killed anything. My work is uh, dedicated to present a notion of enlightenment to the West. The world is not going to be saved purely by religion alone, but the world can be saved also uh, secular enlightenment. This world does need your help so badly, very badly. And so on behalf of this world, 
I would like to request you to come in to do something about it. It takes enormous faith in people to create an enlightened society. You can't have a partial attitude. And that kind of faith wasn't because we were amazing people. It was because of Trumpa's inherent appreciation for the wisdom of the world. The basic point seemed to be is about this life, not to be cowed, afraid to look at things, afraid to be uh, decent. Free to smile. Free to acknowledge that we are basically good. Oh, as the Americans call it, chickening out. When I first met him, he was, of course, still a monk, dressed in monk's robes. And he seemed to me extraordinarily young, ethereal almost, as though he might dissolve into light at any moment. A bit like a flower, you know, a beautiful flower. All his gestures were sort of immaculate. Now I can't actually remember what he said, but we were just overwhelmed by his presence somehow. It seems almost kind of a little naive to say something like that, but there was something very special about him. He was going through a period of really examining how he was going to teach. He really, I think, wasn't sure yet what would be the best way to teach Westerners. Rinpoche was doing various courses in order to familiarize himself with Western culture. He was trying to gather the experience directly for himself of the suffering of the human condition in the West. He got the feeling that he wanted to sort of reach into our little bowl of suffering and say, this is what's happening. And to be able to have the words that we could understand, that we, that were accessible to us, that would allow us to say yes. There was a, an article in the then Telegraph Colour Supplement and there was a full page photograph with Trumpa Rinpoche and Akron Rinpoche standing on the lawn in front. And I'd seen it and I thought I had to be with him. So I gave up my, my job and my, uh, my house and uh, travelled up to Eskdale Muir. I was studying at Cambridge University and uh, I decided uh, prefer to go and live with him. I arrived at Lockerbie Station um, late at night. There was no public transport to Eskdale Muir. And so I walked to Samueling, and it, it's about 17 miles, and uh, I've, I think it must have taken me about six hours. His injunction to me always was that the major change must always be internal. 
in that without meditation, there's, there's, there's no progress. The teaching sometimes would be really kind of in the minute, in conversation, in his room, sometimes late at night. That was where I learned most. This got some of us into a lot of trouble because uh, we would then have to sleep late in the morning and not make morning meditation. Rinpoche would leave Sammy Ling in his monk's robe and change into regular clothes and wander around London a lot. And he said he loved the movie houses because they were dark red velvet and it reminded him of Tibet. It had the kind of warmth that he was missing. I'd been working in an office as a translator and he invited me to be his private secretary. He said that he was planning to make a trip to Bhutan and India. And then he asked me if I would like to go with him. Well, of course I said yes. My trip to Bhutan was invitation of the Queen of Bhutan. And I took my retreat in Taksang. My partner Sambhava actually meditated. Rinpoche said that this was supposedly where Guru Padma Sambhava had thrown down his crystal rosary and then it had turned into a waterfall. Being in Taksang is not particularly impressive at all at the beginning. What is this place? It's supposed to be great. And what's, what's, what's you know, happening here? Maybe this is the wrong place they've chosen. Maybe there's Taksang somewhere else, the real Taksang. But there is actually immense energy and power has taken place. Things begin to come up. Although I live in the slime and muck of the Dark Age, although I stumble in the thick black fog of materialism. The sadhana just came through without any problems. And it took me about, uh, about five hours to write the whole thing. The Dharma is used for personal gain, and the river of materialism has burst its banks. The materialistic outlook dominates everywhere. When the sadhana arrived in his mind, you know, it was a realization. And that's what was written down. The whole idea of a dark age. Spiritual values have been lost. We can see how much damage we have done the planet due to materialism. And that hypocrisy is awesome. Trumper Imache had come to the West in order to transmit the authentic teachings of Buddhism in the West to Westerners. Akron wanted the center in Scotland, Samuel Ling, to be a place where Tibetan refugees could come and find a home. And so they had a very different outlook. That's why there's this huge conflict developed between them. People would get very upset because uh, he wasn't teaching. People wanted a teacher to satisfy their own spiritual greed so they could say, I'm a disciple of Trungpa Rinpoche. And he's doing this to lead me on the path of liberation or something. And then they'd find, actually, he's not doing anything. He's just drunk or trying to seduce my girlfriend or, <laughs> or behaving in a totally outrageous way. It was absolutely electric that first time I set eyes on him. I had never had any experience like that in my life before. I was at a school in Cambridge and I had to find a way to get up and see him. I spent 
I believe, at least 24 hours in bed with him. I think it was the first time in my life that I had felt that I could have 100% communication with somebody. He said to me at one point, maybe someday we could get married. And I said, oh, definitely, yes. <laughs> I'd love to do that. I had to do the shopping, so it meant driving into nearby towns, which is partly when I was taught chumper and I can't to drive. You know, they, they were hopeless at both of them. They, they'd never known roads and traffic. They didn't grow up with them, you know. I always thought you shouldn't let a, a, a Tibetan behind a, a steering wheel. I had heard he hadn't been the best driver in the world. He was driving with a girl in the car, and I don't know if alcohol was involved or not, but the car went out of control and went through a drug shop window. <laughs> And there was Trevor and Pache on a gurney in the hall with huge stitches in his throat. His throat had been cut. And then a while after that, they discovered that he was paralyzed on his left side. He was in such pain, and it took quite a long time before he was able to regain some movement on the left side of his body. He couldn't cook for himself or even things like making beds. You know, not that I ever remember him wanting to make a bed, but... Uh... You couldn't be with him without being aware that there was an extraordinary struggle going on in there. I think that that particular period in Scotland was really the bleakest period in his life. Before the accident, Trungpa Rinpoche had spoken about the dilemma that he felt. The term he used was the golden Buddha on the pedestal. Our main point is to uh, be able to teach fully with the only Western world. And uh, also there is a general sense of uh, fascination in the people's part. And uh, when you talk to them with the robes on, they don't look at you, they don't listen to you, but they look at your robe. People just couldn't accept it. I think people found it too threatening. The English people with their sense of propriety and so forth may have wanted to have their sort of little pet guru. And at the same time, the Tibetans wanted him to wear his robes and hide behind the Tibetanists as a sort of, sort of sense of subtle superiority. So he was completely out there and genuine with who he was, and he was rejected for that. He said to me that he felt that he was a critical point in his life. He said that I'm on the verge of becoming enlightened, and when people get to this point, they either go crazy or they attain realization, which of course made me feel a little bit anxious having just married him. Then it all moved quite quickly. Then uh, it all seemed to be a, the catalyst for the transformation, the re-emerging into the world, having abandoned the, the, the monastic persona. And then the rest, as they say, is history. What made you commit to, you know, about three years of your life to him? What held you to him? Mm. Well, it wasn't me committing. It sounds like I made some uh, generous offer, you know. I wasn't committing. Uh, didn't feel like I was committing uh, my life to him, you know. I actually love being with him. And it's uh, 40 years ago now. <laughs> He was a good friend. <laughs> you know, he's gone, but he was a good friend. So there's no, no commitment there. You know, it just came naturally. Yeah. That's what that's for. <laughs>
uh, so he's, that's it, you know, he came and he went. He met one of the other great Torkus of pretty much similar age to him, who, who had, they had known each other in Tibet, Tronga Rinpoche. Tronga Rinpoche came to him uh, in India and said, so what are you going to do now? And he took out his mirror, little metal mirror he had around his neck. His mirror was a way of, uh, he could um, prophesy, see the future in the mirror. And he started looking into this metal mirror and describing Shambhala. And he said, it's as if I was there and I can see. So that's the only clue that he gave, that he was actually going to America to find Shambhala. human beings, animals, and vegetation. If Jesus Christ were here tonight, you would not dare drop another bomb. It was a tumultuous time, and a time when there was a passionate search for meaning. It had to do with a resistance to the war in Vietnam and the role of the United States in pursuing aggression in that way. The motivation for radical political action was some kind of insight about human liberation. That human beings had a vast potential for freedom. Freedom of expression and freedom of emotion and freedom of thought. That there was a personal side to the journey of growth. That personal liberation and political liberation might not be separate, that they actually might be part of the same journey or part of the same unfolding. In the summer of 70, and it's still a summer of love, uh, <laughs> We traded our apartment for a car and decided to do a road trip. It turned out really crazy, psychedelic summer. So, you know, we pulled up in front of this uh, filthy, dirty farmhouse, you know, with wrecked cars and washing machines in the front porch and hippies wandering around, just shabby, run-down house. We knocked on the door, and this woman was there, Fran, <laughs> and she said, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm, I'm like an art guy. She said, oh, my God, come with me right now. And she took me into this little room in the back, and she opened the door, and she said, I found him. And he said, oh, I've been waiting for you. Sit down. He thought he had asked her to go and find somebody that could draw. There was a weekend program happening called Work, Sex, and Money. And I thought, I'm interested in those things, not necessarily in that order. I really didn't think of him as a Buddhist. I mean, I wasn't really looking for Buddhism or any particular religious uh, path. I just thought he was someone who spoke the truth. In fact, I think I thought he made it up. He just happened to be someone who was so insightful that he could just point out the nature of reality. And when we talk about a tantric tradition, we are not talking about a purely playing with sex, or aggression, or colors, phenomenal world. We are not talking about those areas yet. We have to be very, very concerned with the fundamentals of the whole thing, rather than the whole thing is going to be okay and groovy. And don't worry if you worry, that's your problem. But if you don't worry, everything's going to be okay. Let's dance together. Let's play the music together. Let's drink honey and milk. It doesn't work. 
he had started drawing this uh, letter called A, ah, which means it's the seed syllable for it, sort of the birth of everything that's created. It's the most primary seed syllable. It can be summarized as a dot, a dot in space. So I sat there for two hours, and he knew how the eye worked. He knew about geometry. He knew about Botticelli. And the more it went on, I was like, this is the greatest experience. Finally, an art teacher, I thought he was just an art guy, a hippie, Tibetan hippie. He immersed himself completely in American culture when he moved over here. It wasn't just that it was contrived, that he was going to dress like a hippie and act like a hippie so he could communicate with the hippies. It was that he was absolutely fascinated by anything that people did. He just wanted to basically eat it up. At one point, I was <clears throat> concerned about whether you needed to be celibate on the spiritual path, because I had been reading all the Hindu yoga books that talked about how important celibacy was in meditation. And just as I was getting to that question in my little list, there was a knock on the door, and it was Diana. And he said, oh, come in, sweetie. And so she was wearing a yellow bath towel, just barely covered her, so I didn't know whether to look down or whether to look up. And then he kissed her and he said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll come to bed soon, sweetie. So she left and I didn't actually ask that question. He taught by being a human being. He never said, follow me, imitate me. He said, I am completely who I am and I want to help you understand how to be completely who you are. And he said, just study the Dharma, which is the truth of trusting who you are, discovering your own fundamental goodness, discovering your natural wisdom, and discovering the importance of being compassionate. That has nothing to do with religion. The shrine room was, was the attic of an old farmhouse. And holding up the roof, seemingly, were these posts well, the post became the favorite spot for people to lean up against during sitting meditation practice so that they could doze or just hold themselves up and sort of, you know, be lazy about it. So one day we go into the shrine room and they're gone. And it was him. He had, he had been there two weeks earlier and said, take him out. Unknowns to us. <clears throat> so how he often would, would work is that there would just be, most of the time, just a quarter turn of the screw. It wasn't a big thing. It was just suddenly like, where you used to hang out so that you could slump was no longer slumpable. So now you had to actually sit up. This is a picture of the door at Karma Chilling. You know, it was just a white door, ratty, paint crumbling farmhouse. And he said that he wanted to paint it in, as the entrance to the Dharma in the West. It was very important. And he explained to me the geometry, the sacred geometry, and how it intersects with how your eye is wired. The rods and cones in your eye are actually wired into geometric patterns. And um, how the door, the geometry of the door, would go directly into your eye and um, set off certain kind of signals in your brain. We could not find a turquoise. We left all this stuff on the front porch, and there was a little girl, about five years old, that was playing. And when we were down at the tent listening to the teaching, she had poured all the paint into a bucket. And we came back, and she'd mix it up, and it was the perfect turquoise. And it, and it was getting dark by then, so Chunk was said, oh my god, it's perfect. So we took all the cars and circled around with the headlights and put the headlights on the porch while he sat there and supervised me filling in the turquoise. There is a legend of the Buddha where every step lotus flowers bloom. Almost wherever Trigon Trumpa stepped in America, Tibetan Buddhist Center sprang up. Very early on, maybe in the first year, 
he invited the entire community that could fit in his living room up to visit him and he invited everybody to bring their bags of marijuana, their dope. And half the people thought, oh my God, this guru is so cool. <laughs> he wants to smoke with us. So everybody came and was in a very jolly mood. And he asked everybody to put all their paraphernalia on the big tray in the center. And there was a beautiful fire going in the fireplace. It was all very homey and wonderful. And he began to talk to everybody and welcome everybody. And then one little bag after the other got thrown into the fire, creating all of this spark and popping. And he began to chant, we are burning self-deception. We are burning self-deception. We are burning self-deception with each bag and the fire would blaze up. Supposing if you, so-called you, which we do not know whether we exist or not, but so-called you become enlightened, Then what? Of course, automatic answers then, of course, I become a Buddha, enlightened one. You are about to become egomaniac. You are becoming egomaniac. Not only you are about to, that you are thinking that you could become the Buddha himself. Institute in the summer of 74 was a kind of a distillation. It was sort of like what happened at Woodstock, you know, that all of a sudden, you know, you had this huge movement. It's happening all over the country and it came together. We didn't have a building. We didn't have desks. We didn't have telephones. We didn't have stationery. We had this idea, you know, vision. We invited religious figures, including Native American teachers, Zen teachers, Hindu teachers. We're invited superstars such as Ram Das, who arrived with a retinue of love and lighties, as we call them, dressed in white. <laughs> people there who weren't on religious trips, like Gregory Bateson. We come to Naropa to try to find out what it's all about. We invited all these poets. There was Allen Ginsberg, and Allen was a one-man poetry school. Alan, Do you relate to American jazz, blues, rock and roll? as having possibilities? Maybe uh, jazz has more possibilities, blues have more possibilities, but rock and roll has lesser possibilities. And why do you feel that? Well, it is a question of actually indulging individual sense perceptions. It is too Coca-Cola oriented. Well, um, I think, have you had the experience of, uh, say, uh, majesty? and uh, calm and centeredness in uh, any rock and roll that you've heard? I'm unfortunately not. I tried, it was very hard, Alan. I tried very hard. I thought at some point I was missing something. Yeah. 
but they turned out to be, I wasn't missing anything at all. He liked the poets, he liked the artists, he liked the uh, misfits. He never seemed to want to rein in the energy in terms of uh, setting up an, an institution like Naropa. He kept talking about sparks flying. What we were doing was bringing together East and West, and that was the kind of a creation of a, of a new uh, hybrid. And he said that normally people think of creating some kind of diplomatic relationship between East and West. But what he really wanted was not to do that at all, was to maintain the integrity of each tradition and let them come up against each other so that sparks would fly. Water is so lovely, so lovely. It's like it, it's like love. <laughs> when I arrived at Naropa, schedule was set, and I was put on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or something like that. And Trumpa has. Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. We were both going after truth, and his way of going after truth was Buddhist, and my way of going after truth was Hindu. The people liked getting both sides, and I was fascinated with the they were like there was a tennis match. They were like, you know, they were, Trungpa said this, and they were around us. Uh, uh. If we're going to discuss spirituality at this point in this particular class, I feel very nervous myself, and so should you, that we are not making mutual, building mutual deceptions between each other. We have coined this word called spiritual materialism. Spiritual materialism, which dedicated to pursuing a self, ego, that you use mantras, chantings, meditations, all kinds, to become oneself a greater and powerful person. He did not give a talk in the first five or six or eight years without reminding people how foolish their grappling after spirituality to save themselves was. He was cruel from the point of view of relentlessly dismantling whatever you could use to cling on to some constructed version of ego. Let us mock the ego, but let us build our spirit <clears throat> Spirit, in this case, as a sense of uh, inquisitiveness, that something might have happened. There's a possibility of something's taking place. But ego's approach is that, is that going to be good for me? Should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? If I get it, how much it is money's worth, so to speak? Trumpa was um, the head and I was the heart. Things like soul, God, Ram and Krishna, and all that. That seemed like cluttered compared to him. It is absolutely important to make the practice of meditation is a source of your strength, source of your basic intelligence. And think about that. You know there's such a possibility you could sit and do nothing for 20 minutes, 10 minutes. Just sit and do nothing. You can think about Narabha Institute while you're sitting, if you like. You shouldn't be too embarrassed to tell that message to your parents, your relatives, your friends, that you've learned a very valuable message 
that you can actually survive by doing nothing. Rinpoche had a great command of English. He said, English is a blessed language. He could speak redneck, he could speak chamber, good American Chamber of Commerce, he could speak Oxonian English. But it wasn't just a mimicry. His mind sort of entered into the American mindset and realized you had to do it through language. You use the word inaccessible in referring to Vajrayana teachings. And what was the implication there? Well, it's very rare. And therefore, you probably don't get it. Now, like if you order uh, steak tartare, um, very few people order such a dish, and usually somebody order hamburger, yeah, hot dog. And steak tartare is very rare. And a crucial moment came when the great 16th Karmapa, who is the head of Churgan Trumpa's lineage, is coming to the United States. He tells, you know, like the students, this great news, the 16th Karmapa is coming. And the response is, groovy. But do we really have to vacuum for him? tirelessly, hours and hours, round the clock, getting ready for this visit. Having people go into, get decent clothes, getting, uh, cutting your hair, getting uh, suits and ties, which most people went to the Salvation Army to get because nobody had any money particularly. That infuriated people. Sexuality didn't shock people in those days. Drinking didn't shock people. But wear a suit? Are you kidding? So many, many students left at that point in protest. <laughs> All of the forms or rituals or disciplines are ways of shifting the mind. First of all, to create some kind of wakefulness so that you can even appreciate what's going on and then to connect us into the particular activity that's taking place. You need a kind of majesty inside to meet the majesty outside of yourself. What you have recommended to us is that we should cut off our long hair, put on neckties, and re-enter the mainstream of American institutions and attempt to exert a wholesome influence from within. That's right. <laughs> We always have a problem with the taming ourselves. That is why we have to resort to religion, basically. Taming here meaning simply being decent. No ups and downs. Some sense of equilibrium natural state of existence. That kind of training demanded a teacher who was hard to be around a lot. Once I asked him, why don't more students just come see you, knock on the door, call you on the phone, come over? And he said, I feel that it is because there's fear in students of becoming unmasked exposed. This was a very important principle for him. People having the courage to work with their own self-deception. Where does purpose and motivation come in in the enlightened mind that is free from desire and striving? 
Where does his, his purposes come from? Well, purposes come from having a sense of trust in oneself, sense of uprightness, sense of loyalty, sense of appreciation of one's family and one's immediate world around you. Uh, there is a cloud in the sky, and the sky is blue, and the sun rises beautifully in the east, and uh, snowflakes have their own beauty in the falling on the ground. And everything's perfect. <laughs> uh, pretty much. <laughs> He was always teaching us from the crazy wisdom style. And the, the teaching was, there is no certainty. And you could have a sense of humor about that. We don't want to really be fully sane. And that seemed to be our problem usually, that we can't handle too much sanity. And we would like to have a little corner for neurosis somewhere, even in our pockets, just a little puff here and there. So if you find too much sanity, you say, boy, it was heavy. ロコウティニゴマロンドドティリニティニソンソンチュノレミニコノソンジェリタレソンタンキュリタレデトニゲンディリタレネズパパクマダンデラマカンチェレンダグマロコンクトヨウキチョバクホロジョンジョコンタン
uh, definitely. Whatever the exact diagnosis was, he definitely drank too much. People say to me, how could you follow a teacher like that? Or how could an enlightened person do that? I do not know. I can't buy a, a party line where I say it was sacred activity or something like this. Come up with ground to make it okay. I also can't come up with ground or a fixed idea to make it not okay. You know, I'm left, really left in that I don't know. I don't know. But I, I can't answer the relative questions because he defied being able to answer them. When Suzuki Roshi died, Chugyam Trumpa gave a talk at the Zen Center. And as he was giving the talk, he said that uh, Suzuki Roshi was a very great teacher and a very dear friend. And at that point, he began to weep. So uh, he he could probably just sense and see that we were trying to hold ourselves back and it gave us permission for all of us to weep. So that in itself was a wonderful teaching. Most cultures at their inception had some kind of idea of trying to bring out the noblest part of the human spirit. Rinpoche searched for models that would work in the West. He didn't just want to impose Eastern models onto his Western students. In America, the President of the United States lives and works in his house. And in Europe, the place where the monarch lived was also the seat of government. So that's one thing. I think he realized that that was a powerful model that had already existed. Court was this really rich environment that was his home, and it was kind of a community center at the same time. In Boulder, in during Rinpoche's lifetime, my main role was the master of the household, was my title, of the Kalapa Court. Like a typical evening at the court, the music being played might be Mozart, Handel. Um, he loved Handel's water music. Crisp, uh, tongue-in-cheek, um, British formality. Call each other like Mr. Peisinger and Mrs. Fordham. This is not just like saying a nice thing, but that anything and everything can be met. When we meet it with awareness, there's potential to uncover some kind of power. And therefore, there is nothing that is outside of the practice. Therefore, he introduced almost a practice for anything. Absolutely anything. You know, drinking a cup of tea, combing your hair, putting your underwear in a drawer. One time I had the experience of watching him set the dining room table and it took three hours because it was like a, a work of art to set the dining room table. He really found the way Americans spoke English to be sloppy. And he thought it reflected that if you didn't work with how you spoke, that there was a way in which body and mind were not joined. So speech is the thing, is one of the things that can really join those, so that you have everything sort of lined up. You have synchronized your body, speech, and mind. So he took that to the next level, and he started not only teaching people how to speak the English language, but he decided to teach them the Queen's English. The how to speak the English language and how not to speak Americanism. All right, I'll give you an example of an elocution exercise. Spider 
is black. Sky is blue. How tantalizing this world. Kathy's hair is black. Her complexion is white. Her attention is like a bow string. More than monumental. More than tattered. More than dying. The Liberty Bell is more than antique. Ultimately, he was trying to demonstrate how sound had a sacred element. So in spite of the appearance of torturing people <laughs> by making them repeat these words over and over again, I think it <laughs> was much more about appreciation. So actually, it became a visualization practice. We would come on duty, put on our uniforms, and walk into a visualization. We were imagining ourselves as enlightened servants of the enlightened master. And on some level, it was all true. On some level, it was, it was reality. On some level, it was all play. He said that in order to create an enlightened society, you have to change the culture. And in order to change the culture, you have to change the art. And in order to change the art, you have to change the principles that art is based on. And those principles, he said, should be the principles of Dharma art. The basic notion of art at all means how to relate oneself and how to relate with one's phenomena world gracefully. Dharma art, rather than looking at a painting of a river, is more like being in the water, in the river. When there's enough sensory space, then we can afford to relax more and we begin to find what's known as the sacred world that any artistic endeavor is regarded as sacred. When that happened, there is uh, no struggle. The idea in Dharma art is to receive images. It's not an ego trip. All you did was see it and uh, bring it to the surface. You sort of caught the fish, you didn't create the fish, <laughs> you know? Things are sacred, not in a sense of religious means, but sacred in the sense that there is a natural dignity in the way we view our world. He was sitting up on the altar of this church, smoking cigarettes, and someone asked him a question to talk about aggression in America. He said, I want to talk about the aggression in this room. This was the Dorje Cost. It was given that name because it literally means uh, protecting the sacred space. Chukum Drungpa believed that every aspect of society had to be explored, every single aspect. And so he created theater groups and he created commerce groups, he created educational institutions, and he also created a Buddhist version of military. Everyone had a hard time with it. But he would say over and over again, 
until we reach into the heart of aggression of society and we transmute that very same energy to be the forces of peace, we couldn't really change the way things worked. I was involved in organizations and marches protesting the United States presence in Vietnam. What I came to feel was that those of us who were doing that had in the end no more, no greater insight about the fundamental problem of aggression than the government and the army that we were protesting against. The Shambhala principle is uh, what is known as the, the path of the warrior. Here again, it doesn't mean to say the creator of a war is a warrior, but warrior in the sense of braveness, being brave. We would drill for hours in uniform, and occasionally we would have visitors, and one of those visitors asked him once, why are you doing this military thing? And, and his response was that someday people will see the Dorje Kasung marching down a street and it will cause them to feel like they want to smile. And at that point, we'll actually have changed something at the core of the modern society of the problem as it was. It took us 10 years to figure out that he was teaching traditional Buddhism. We didn't know that because he was, if you ever read traditional Buddhism, you go, huh? But his incredible ability with language to translate that into our language so that he was able to touch your heart. And he was also able to sort of make you, your mind inquisitive. So your constant feeling was that your journey was truly what is traditionally described as the path is going underneath you and you are just continually uh, opening up to whatever you are encountering. First time I met Trungpa Rinpoche, John said, Rinpoche, I'd like to introduce you to my wife, Agnes. And Rinpoche looked like this. And he took my hand and he said, hello. And then he turned to John and said, I find your wife very attractive. And I leapt off the floor and jumped in back of John and looked at Rinpoche over John's shoulder, thinking, what is he talking about? Or who is this man? <laughs> Lots of his students were his lovers, and that was known. My impression as I sort of looked at your community was that this was like part of what went on, and it was certainly open. You know, I remember watching Rinpoche with his entourage, and you could just sort of see who was who, was who you know, in the, in the entourage. Of course, in the Zen world, you know, things were more hidden, I think we could say. And so the issue there became more that things were hidden. Can you push down a little bit, sweetheart? I just said sweetheart in Japanese. <laughs> he didn't hide anything. He didn't hide his drinking. He didn't hide his uh, sexuality. There's so many Western teachers, as well as Asian teachers in the West, who have been brought down by what's called sexual misconduct. But if you really look closely, that's not what caused them to come down. It was that the students felt deceived and lied to. The first time he slept with somebody, after I married him, he was still at Sam Ling, and I was completely freaked out. I sat on the floor of the bathroom and just cried all night. And the next day, I went in and I talked to him and told him I was completely distraught. I couldn't believe that, you know, he just married me and now maybe I had to divorce him because he was sleeping around. And he said to me, it's not that I don't love you. Our relationship is much, much stronger and more powerful than sexual fidelity, so to speak. That I'm never going to be able to be a conventional husband, but you can always completely 100% rely on our relationship and our love for each other, but it's just not going to be conventional. Sexual activity, what there was, 
It was about liberating desire rather than creating more desire. And so you take that place of desire where it's the most, which is in the sexual activity, and you apply uh, some kind of wakefulness, some kind of where you actually are present all the way through. So it's a very potent place to work from. You know, sometimes I would sit with him for hours, two, three, four hours in almost total silence. So sometimes it was really lonely. <laughs> You know, my husband, Jonathan, has always said, and those were not, we were married, so those weren't easy times for him. And he's always said, and not always in an enlightened way, I'm second to the teacher. I'm second to the guru. And it's true. I was jealous. It was much more of, huh, you're able to have... Um, a uh, special relationship with him, and I can't. Actually, calling it a relationship is even tricky, because there wasn't that kind of solidity to it, really. We're not talking about the person, Trungpa Rinpoche, but we are talking about the manifestation of that mind, which sees reality as it is, and is able to wake people up, but only because you share that mind. In the West, it's easy to misunderstand devotion in the Tibetan tradition. It looks from the outside as if there's this great, great person and then these little people falling at the great person's feet. But, in fact, the tradition itself is very clear that the teacher has nothing more than the student, that the wisdom exists already. It is born with it. We die with it. We can't get rid of it. We can't get more of it. The teacher points that out. And the student gradually comes to that understanding and the minds meet. After being married to him for 17 years, I would still sometimes lie in bed next to him and look at him and thinking, I have no idea who you are. I mean, he was completely unfathomable. You could never really second guess his reaction. Love, talking about love is just like an insult sort of to like our relationship because it was just like he treated me as the reincarnated Lama that I was recognized as. So in terms of love with my father, do we ever talk about love? There was never any talk of something like that. There, I mean, he treated me like he would have treated um, a, a king of another country, you know? He always knew that his intentions were good and you could always expect that he would be kind. But fundamentally, I don't really know what made him tick. When I ride a horse, I hold my seat. When I play with snakes, I snap them on my wrist. When I play with dangerous maidens, I let them talk first. Crazy wisdom, as I understand it, means not planting your foot firmly, either in the material world or the spiritual world. When we have the spiritual world view, then we are bounded by the so-called the spiritual view. And then when we are materialistic, we are bounded by the so-called materialistic view. But if you go beyond that, if you take this extra leap, then that is the crazy wisdom uh, leap. Uh, it's like taking a leap into the abyss, but it's not the abyss of nothingness, it's the abyss of reality. 
he could have had, I think, success without fully committing himself in the way he did. Um, could have had a nice community and a good life as it were, but he really never thought about his own self-preservation. How much that we have actually trying to connect with our own heart and how much of that particular attempt to connect with our own heart has been repelled because you might discover something terrible in you. He taught me so much. He taught me everything that I know about art and he showed it to me by being genuinely fully who he was. He was human, completely human, and he didn't hide it. He didn't hide his tears. He didn't hide his, his wounds. When we want really to connect with our heart, what are, what are you, who are you, where's your heart? If you just put your hand through your rib cage and feel your heart, there's a tenderness. Feels sore and soft and it hurts. And you want to spill your heart to relate with the others. That type of tenderness does bring a notion of fearlessness. Fearlessness that you have a possibility so that the world around you can tickle your heart your raw heart. It was his way of saying, you know, um, it, it's a form of strength. Uh, so, so when you when you feel that tenderness in you, then you become stronger. He lived his life. He was like the the greatest bodhisattva. Bodhisattva vows to give up any thing that has to do with himself and help other people. And that's all he was ever doing. I see you're going to make me cry. <laughs> that's all he was doing. I can't believe I went to the hospital and I had some question about the interior decoration of A Suite on Tower Road. And Remshay was dying and and I was I went to his bedside and and it was like, well I know he can't hear me, but I could kind of verbalize my thought and maybe I will receive some kind of answer about what should happen in this case. And it was almost like a television screen came up in front of me and it was static, black and white static all across it. You know, it's over. No more questions. A belt of pack ice covered three quarters of the harbor and extended nearly eight nautical miles out to sea. Pack ice is common at this time of year, but it rarely reaches Halifax. The whole kind of seacoast when you looked out it looked all frozen and cold. And that's how we all felt because he was passing away. He opened his eyes and almost sat up. Everybody was kind of waiting for that moment. Everybody got the message that he was communicating with us that this was going to be it. There's a moment here that's, that's, that this is going to be my last word and it's going to be to you. <laughs> it had that feeling. Everybody waiting. And at one point we started to sing the anthem, the Shambhala anthem. But nobody, I don't know how it started, maybe someone said let's sing the anthem. 
We sang the anthem. And it was kind of like, uh, it was like our, our last offering to him. He opened his eyes and he looked around the room. And as the anthem finished, he took a few more breaths. And each, with each bout breath, we'd be waiting because we didn't know whether there'd be another one. And so then I went outside, the ice had started moving out, and by the, I don't know, by the end of the day or the next morning, it was a lot of ice, it had all gone out. The sky got blue. I've seen teachers who have tried to emulate him, and for a few years, maybe it's fun. But day in and day out, every year, 24 hours, they say, I don't know how he did it. So you can really say, well, it's either, you know, he, he, he was crazy, or he was crazy wisdom, and there was something very amazing about that. Even in a film like this, if the message were to be conveyed that he was about being defined or framed in any way whatsoever, that would defy the whole purpose of his life, which was to allow ourselves to be unframed and fluid and allow others, you know, to come forth in their sort of basic goodness.
I see it. I'm not convinced that it's phenomenal. It's completely around the sun. And there's one right over there. Rainbows. <laughs> <laughs> Something in the clouds. Something in the sky. <laughs> <laughs>